Hi everyone, this is the second video related to session 9 and 10 and it specifically considers something called the poverty trap and the poverty trap arises under neoclassical growth theory assumptions but when there is endogenous population growth. Just to flag, this should not be confused with endogenous growth theory. At its fundamental, this is a neoclassical growth theory model and the only difference is that what we have assumed is rather than population growth being exogenous to the model, population growth is assumed to be endogenous within this model. To see how it works, we draw our neoclassical growth model diagram. Um, on the horizontal axis, we're measuring capital per person. On the vertical axis, we're measuring output per person. Like with the standard neoclassical growth theory, the production function has a concave shape or is bowed out, indicating that as capital per person increases, output per person increases at a decreasing rate. The savings function follows the same shape as the investment as the production function. In other words, as output per person increases at a decreasing rate, and as in the economy, um, individuals save a constant portion of that output per person, which is growing at a decreasing rate, so too does savings grow at a decreasing rate. What's different in this model, as compared to the standard neoclassical growth theory model, is the shape of the investment requirement line. And I've drawn in here the investment requirement line in blue, and what you should notice is that it starts off relatively steeply sloped and then begins to flatten out and eventually becomes a constant line. The reason for that is that in this model we are assuming that the population growth rate is endogenous and in fact that the population growth rate is dependent on the level of output per person. The reason why we assume this is because it has been shown that particularly at as countries have different levels of output per person or different living standards, those different levels of living standards are associated with different population growth rates. So for example, when output per person is low, population growth typically is quite high. So in very, very poor countries where living standards are quite low, unfortunately those countries are typically the countries that have very high population growth rates. And what we then do to illustrate that in terms of our investment requirement line, we recognize that when output per person is quite low, population growth is high, which means that the investment requirement line is going to be relatively steeply sloped. As output per person increases, so as we get to higher levels of output per person, birth rates and death rates start to fall. Um, the way to think about this is that as countries start to develop, the birth rates in countries and the death rates start to fall, and population growth slows down. So here, as the, as the output per person has increased, the population growth rate starts to slow down, and we represent that by a slight decrease in the slope of the investment requirement line. So initially, the investment requirement line is very steeply sloped, at low levels of output per person when population growth is high. But as population growth starts to slow down in kind of middle levels of output per person, we represent that by, a, by the slope of the investment requirement line also decreasing. Eventually, at higher levels of output per person, the investment requirement line becomes a constant slope. And this is because when levels of output per person are much higher, typically birth rates and death rates are low. So the population growth rate stabilizes at a somewhat lower level and the investment requirement line then becomes a constant slope. So essentially then, this investment requirement line with its very strange shape is strangely shaped because of the fact that the population growth rate is assumed to be endogenous with respect to output per person. In this model, only the investment requirement line has a different shape, 
and it's because of the endogenous population growth. In other words, population growth depends on output per person. The consequence of there being a um, strangely shaped investment requirement line is that we don't just have a single possibility in terms of a steady state. There are multiple possibilities in terms of a steady state. As we know, steady state is where the investment requirement line intersects the savings function. And because of the shape of the investment requirement line, we can identify three different points where the investment requirement line and the savings function intersect each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark off those possible steady state equilibrium points. And as we know, the steady state is where savings per person equals investment per person. So at point A, savings at A is equal to investment at A. At B, savings at B is equal to investment at B. And at C, savings at C is equal to investment at C. That gives a capital to labor ratio at A of KA, at B of KB, and at C of KC. And then the associated levels of output per person we can also indicate as follows. YA, YB, and YC. So there, there are these three possible equilibrium points. And what we are going to show is that countries, particularly very, very poor countries, often get stuck in the lowest of these steady states because, as I'm going to demonstrate, this is a stable steady state and the economy would tend to move towards the steady state. And the consequence would be that these economies become stuck in a poverty trap where there is very low levels of output per person, but where it is also very difficult to expand capital per person enough to ensure that the output growth rate can actually rise and that the economy can move out of poverty. All right, so how do these um, equilibriums, these different possible equilibriums work? Well, first of all, consider a level of capital person per person which is below the level of K star A. At levels of capital per person below K star A, the savings function exceeds the investment function. So at this point, if the economy has a very low level of capital stock per person, because savings exceeds investment, there is an excess pool of funds that firms can borrow from in order to finance their investment expenditure and increase capital stock, and therefore capital stock per person rises. And as capital stock per person rises, output per person also increases, albeit at a decreasing rate. Eventually, the economy would move to a steady state at point A, where the steady state level of capital stock is KA, and the steady state level of output per person is YA. We call that a stable equilibrium. The reason why it's a stable equilibrium is think about a capital to labor ratio somewhere in between KA and KB. If we look at what's going on in terms of investments and savings between the capital to labor ratios KA and KB, here, we have a situation where the investment requirement line is greater than the savings function. So at levels of capital stock per person higher than KA, but less than KB, the amount of investment that would be needed to maintain any capital to labor ratio between KA and KB is um, insufficient, okay, or rather the amount of investment, sorry, which is required is in excess of the savings which is av available. It's the savings which is insufficient because the investment requirement line lies above the savings function here. When the investment requirement line lies above the savings function and the investment needed <coughs> is in excess of the savings available, it wouldn't be possible to sustain higher levels of capital stock per person, and the economy would move back towards the steady state at point A. So the issue then with the equilibrium at A 
it is a stable equilibrium because the economy tends to move towards it. Steady state equilibrium B is what we would call an unstable equilibrium, and that's because the economy tends to move away from the equilibrium at point B. We've already explained how the economy would move away from point B because when the capital to labor ratio is lower than KB, investment required exceeds state savings, so the economy tends to move back towards the lower steady state equilibrium. At capital to labor ratios in excess of KB, however, what we see here is that savings is greater than investment. And if the savings function lies above the investment function like it does here, this means that the pool of savings available for firms to borrow from is in excess of the investment requirement that they would need to maintain capital to labor ratios which are higher than KB but less than KC. What would happen is that the capital to labor ratio could therefore increase because savings exceed investments. As the capital to labor ratio increases, output per person would rise <coughs> and the economy would move to the steady state equilibrium at point C. So equilibrium B is unstable because on either side of that equilibrium, if the capital to labor ratio decreases, the economy will move to A. On the right hand side, if the capital to labor ratio increases beyond KB, the economy will move towards point C. Point C is another stable equilibrium. And that's because in, at capital to labor ratios in excess of KC, the economy would tend to move back towards KC. Why would that be the case? Well, because at capital to labor ratios higher than KC, the investment required to maintain those higher capital to labor ratios would exceed the amount of savings being generated that wouldn't be sustainable, so capital to labor ratios would fall back to KC and the steady state equilibrium would be achieved at point C. So equilibrium A is a steady state equilibrium which is stable. Equilibrium B is a steady state equilibrium but which is not stable, it's an unstable equilibrium. And equilibrium C is a steady state equilibrium which is stable. Equilibrium A, we call that a poverty trap because it would be very, very difficult for an economy to be able to attract enough investments somehow to be able to expand the capital to labor ratio to a level that they would need in order to be able to ensure that they achieve higher levels of output per person. And that's because everywhere between KA and KB, those levels of capital per person would actually be unsustainable and the economy would move back to point A. It's only if in an economy which is suffering from a poverty trap like this, if they were able to increase the amount of capital stock per person so that it exceeded K star B, perhaps by putting on a, what we would call a big push, for example, if they were able to increase their capital to labor ratio beyond K star B, then they would eventually be able to achieve the higher steady state equilibrium where output per person would be much higher.